Thank you, Mr. President. This privileged speech comes today to commemorate and celebrate World Oceans Day today and World Environment Day last Friday, June 5. The title, Living Green Today for a Healthier and Safer Tomorrow. The day would not be too far when all else would be lost, not only for the present generation, but also for those to come. Generations which stand to inherit nothing but parched earth incapable of sustaining life. Mr. President, I've just quoted the Philippine Supreme Court in its landmark decision 22 years ago that upheld the concept of intergenerational responsibility, which I'm sure our Bartak Nutter, Senator Coco Pimentel knows too well. The responsibility of every generation to ensure that succeeding generations will continue to enjoy a balanced and helpful ecology. Last June Pride, we observed World Environment Day. Today, we celebrate World Oceans Day. These celebrations ought to make us value the natural resources we are bountifully blessed and encourage us to fulfill our duty as stewards of the Earth. Lamentably, there are many threats to our environment and biodiversity, many of which are human-induced. We are responsible in keeping our planet healthy, clean, and safe for future generations. But if we assess the status of our environment today, do our children and our would-be grandchildren and the generations to come deserve the earth we will leave behind for all of them. According to the World Health Organization, air pollution is the world's biggest environmental problem. About 8 million people worldwide die each year because of poor air quality. India and China have the most number of polluted cities included in the top 20 most polluted in the world. Delhi in India is number one on the list. Particulate matter pollution in the city for 2012 is at 261 micrograms per cubic meter. The standard should be 60 micrograms per cubic meter, and this is a quote. The poor quality of air in these two countries has resulted in a decrease of life expectancy of Indians by 3.2 years and of Chinese by three years. In India, for every 100,000 people, 155 die of chronic respiratory disease. Now, where does the Philippines lie? Here in our country, we have yet to reach the standard of air quality. However, our authorities claim it is gradually improving. Not from what I see, not from what we see, and look at the smog that envelopes the national capital region. In the monitoring of the DNR's Environmental Management Bureau, in NCR, between January and April of this year, the total suspended particulates of ESP in the air is at 130 micrograms per cubic meter. The international standard for ESP is 90 micrograms per cubic meter, meaning the air is toxic and poisonous. What about those who don't have cars and air conditioning? What about those who commute every day? which is the majority of our population. What of those, those who can't afford air cleaners and all the contraptions for a healthier, safer existence? The Clean Air Act, enacted into law by this chamber way back in 99, I think principally sponsored by Senator Greg Onasan and co-sponsored by many of us present here today, including this representation, must be followed strictly. It should be the tool in improving air quality in our country. Now, in terms of our water quality, let's take a look at Manila Bay, which is bordered by five cities of NCR, four provinces in regions three and four, and within its watershed are 12 other cities in Metro Manila and four other provinces. I was hoping we would have a better picture when I say better, a more realistic picture of Manila Bay, which I saw in the front pages of a broadsheet, I think it was a Philippine Daily Inquirer today, where it was all human-induced waste or solid waste, uncollected, illegally thrown into Manila Bay as an open dump. Even in its current polluted state, Mr. President, the bay continues to be a source of food 
what kind of food, livelihood and recreation to an estimated one-fourth of our population, 23 million Filipinos. It is estimated that at least 8.7 billion pesos a year is earned from Manila-based resources used in aquaculture, tourism, and in port, harbors, and offshore fisheries. In its 2013 report, the Manila Bay Coordinating Office of the DNR, it said that in terms of liquid waste management, only 44% of monitored of the 3,381 industries and commercial establishments have complied with the DNR EMB effluent standards. Only 10% of the 14 million, 15,100 total household population of MWSS coverage are connected to sewer lines and served by sewerage systems. And 30% of the pollution loading is treated in accordance with current regulations and standards. In fact, no less than attorney Tony Mocosa had won the case against the Philippine government of people of the Philippines on the Manila Bay issue. In fact, I believe that a Supreme Court Associate Justice has been designated to see the implementation of the case that was won more than five years ago. In terms of solid waste management, out of 178 LGUs within the Manila Bay region, only 51% are compliant with segregation of source, 50% for segregated collection, only 44% with functional MRF or material recovery facilities, and 30% with the allowed disposal facilities or sanitary landfills. Only two of the concerned local government units have an approved 10-year solid waste management plan. The harrowing fact, more than 60% of the waste collected by environmental groups in the Manila Bay during a cleanup drive were made of plastic, which is very dangerous because plastic bags can choke and poison marine species and damage marine ecosystems. Look at that photo, a bay of trash. According to the study, plastic waste inputs from land into the ocean published in the journal Science of the 275 million tons of plastic waste generated in 192 coastal countries worldwide in 2010. Plastic debris entering the ocean was somewhere between 4.8 and 12.7 million metric tons. The Philippines is a third top contributor with around 0.28 to 0.75 million metric tons of plastic marine waste annually, next only to China and Indonesia. This goes to show that we must strictly enforce, it's about time, after almost 15 years, the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act, otherwise all efforts to rehabilitate Manila Bay and all other marine ecosystems would be futile. Unless we learn how to manage our waste, starting with proper garbage segregation and disposal, we will never be able to clean our waters in our communities. Meanwhile, in terms of protecting and preserving our rich biodiversity, we need greater immediate action against unregulated development. Our forests, our oceans, our mineral deposits have come under such intense human pressure that our biodiversity and whole ecosystem are now under threat. A significant step towards the preservation and protection of our country's biodiversity is the establishment of a system of protected areas, ranging from huge natural parks, landscapes, and seascapes. And this is exactly what we aim with the passage, hopefully, of the expanded National Integrated Protection Protected Area System Act, which was passed in 1992, long before I became senator, and this NEPA declared more than 113 protected areas. But to date, Mr. President, Congress has only enacted 13 national landmarks of the 113 protected areas. Even with the passage of measures such as the expanded NEPA, the collaborative effort between and among government agencies, civil society, citizenry, are most important towards protecting our heritage and our natural resources. Take the Ifugao rice terraces, dubbed as the eighth wonder of the world. 
a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has been removed from the UNESCO's list of heritage in danger two years ago because it was inscribed, it was deleted, now it is returned. But today, again, unmanaged, mismanaged development continues to threaten this cultural treasure. Multi-story structures and shanties made of cemented walls and the roofs, tin roofs, are already replacing the resilient traditional Ipagao houses, losing the cultural and aesthetic value of the villages surrounding the terraces. Reports say that pests, including worms and snails, are causing major damage to the structures of the terraces, causing some to collapse, calling on the DA to do something about it. Tubataha, as we all know, is another UNESCO site that was damaged when the U.S. Navy ship USS Garden ran aground two years ago. I believe the U.S. government has paid the Philippine government the full amount of 2,000 square meters of damage to the reef, and it promised to provide assistance to the Coast Guard. I'm not certain of the exact amount that the U.S. government paid the Philippine government. Perhaps someone can give me the exact figure, but I believe they should have paid by now. The greater challenge is a reef's successful rehabilitation, not just the monetary payment of the U.S. government. Furthermore, there should be concerted efforts to protect and rehabilitate coral reefs in all our marine ecosystems in the countries, and not just coral reefs, actually. Sea grass beds, mangroves, etc. A typical square kilometer of healthy coral reef can produce up to 40 metric tons of seafood every year. The Tuataha Reef generates over 200 metric tons of seafood annually. However, only 1% of coral reefs in the country remain in excellent condition. No Filipino family needs to be hungry, Mr. President, with such diverse and rich marine resources. Boracay Island, we were just talking about it, Mr. President. You, if I may quote you, I'm not certain whether you want to be quoted. You said that if you want to know what an LGU must not do, look at Boracay. I am sorry if that was said to me in confidence, Mr. President, but at this point, I laud you for what you've done in your humble city of Iloilo, which will be the site of the Independence Day celebrations. I mourn with you, Mr. President, on this beautiful picture, which is not this way anymore because I call on the LGU of Boracay, which is Malay Aklam, and the local government officials from Barangay to mayor to governor to please do something that's right to protect this heritage site, which is a beautiful, popular tourist destination, which has been featured on Condé Nast and many of the European magazines in our country. Again, it is suffering from coral cover loss apart from sewage and many more which I can't even recall, including over construction. According to a study funded by the JICA, tourism related activities such as unmonitored snorkeling even and diving were seen as the culprit behind the 70% coral cover loss in the island over a 23 year period from 1988 to 2011. I have the facts here. Tupataha Reef's damage payment was 87 million and 33,570 pesos. million. How many coral reefs can that actually do? Also, a great threat to biodiversity, as well as to climate change mitigation efforts, is the alarming increase in the number of coal fired power plants in the country. A middle call for sustainable development and deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. It is alarming and unfortunate that we will continue to witness coal plants being constructed in the next several years because in the past five years alone, 21, if my figures are accurate, coal-fired power plant projects were granted an environmental compliance certificate by the EMB DEMR. Some are operational, some are under construction. This is not the kind of environment that our children and our children's children deserve. Even before they are born, they have already been robbed of their right to a healthy, safe, and secure living environment. We must all work towards building a sustainable and resilient community, one that respects biodiversity and corrects the misconception that natural resources are infinite. 
Our extractive and consumptive practices must change. Greed must cease. Let us all become true stewards of the environment that has been entrusted to humankind. Senator Sani Angara just mentioned to me before I delivered that speech that, yes, it is indeed stewardship that is called upon in this intergenerational responsibility, and I agree. Intergenerational responsibility. I hope that will become a buzzword for you politicians running in 2016 and beyond. Intergenerational responsibility and stewardship because our natural resources are not infinite. Intergenerational responsibility needs to move from being an idea, which I am putting on the floor now, to a plan of concrete and urgent action. If we start today, there is no promise that we will be lucky enough to see the undoing of the damage on our environment within our lifetime. But at least we leave our world with a gift of hope for a better, kinder future. Thank you, Mr. President. A few questions from the chair, if the good.